Trading Center. Good morning on this Monday morning. Welcome to another week of the Art Lewis Show here on WSGW. Uh, looking ahead this morning at 10 o'clock, we're going to help celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Bay County Libraries. And Trish Burns, the library director, will be with us at 10 o'clock this morning. At 11 o'clock on Focus, Sawmill Pub and Grill will be the subject. going to be open all year from now on. And we will be telling you about that. The food and beverage manager, Megan, uh, will be with us this morning. Uh, but for this hour, uh, we've uh, talked about this in the past of uh, when we get into the election cycle like we're in right now, uh, what races we will cover, what races we won't cover. Uh, we will tend not to do any local races for local government positions, mainly because there are just too many of them. And there's no way we could cover them all uh, because uh, the rules are pretty simple. If we do one candidate for office, then we offer the same time to all candidates for that office. Thus, we restrict ourselves to doing federal races and state races. And such is the case this morning. And in this case, we are looking at a candidate running for the 94th district of the State House, a seat currently held by the incumbent, Amos O'Neill. And with us this morning is the man who's running to try and unseat him. We say good morning to Robert Zelli. Robert, good morning to you. Well, good morning, Art. It's a pleasure to be here. Ah, thanks for coming in this morning. Uh, before we get into the race and the issues and those things, give us a little background on Robert Zelli. Well, I'm 69 years young. I was raised in Bridgeport in a family business. I have uh, five daughters, one son, and 11 beautiful grandkids. I uh, really, uh, uh, I've been sitting on the sideline watching a lot of things going on, and and I just feel like it's time for for me to get in there and see if I can help fix some of these issues. Uh, and so, uh, what was the family business? So what my, did you do for a living? Well, my father owned a case equipment business, and so oh, I was raised yeah. in that business there. Uh, my grandfather and my dad started it back in the 60s, and we started out in the farm implement, and then we got in the uh, construction equipment. And so uh, my education came from there, uh, learning uh, how to serve service customers. So, And I'm an entrepreneur by nature. Um, my grandfather was the ultimate entrepreneur. And so I've been involved with a lot of different types of businesses from marketing, advertising, to sporting goods, to all kind of neat stuff that I did through the years. Uh, Republican by party. Uh, what drew you into politics? Ever since I was actually a kid uh, in high school, 1972, it was the Nixon McGovern. And... Uh, uh, is interesting. Bob Hanley was my government teacher, which was uh, Mike's brother, and uh, he would always come in there and tell us why George McGovern should be the president. And I would always come in there and say, "Hey, well, here's why Nixon should be president." And so I, <laughs> I started back then, and uh, and always always had a passion for it. Ever since I was a young boy, really. All right, so uh, we sit here in the ninety fourth district, which covers. Saginaw and uh, part of the township. Uh, what do you see as uh, the hot issues? Well, number one, I believe uh, education is very important to me. I feel education is something that we really need to address. And I also uh, feel like crime right now is another thing that uh, um, needs to be dealt with. And the other key to it is uh, bringing the entrepreneur spirit into the District 94 if we don't find a way to create opportunities um, to help, you know, the 5,000 single moms, the 12,000 children without a father in the home, and the 16,000 children in poverty, and I think it's important that we find ways of we could, we should be able to solve these problems. Uh, I don't know why we haven't. We can go to Mars, but we can't fix education. Uh, we can't deal with crime, and I don't understand why we can't. So. Um, I've been working on some solutions for many years on all these issues. So, All right, let's take them one at a time. We'll start with one closest to my heart, crime. I'm co-chair of the Crime Prevention Council in Saginaw and a member of the sheriff's uh, support deputies. 
How do you address crime? What do you see as the biggest stumbling block? Well, um, one of the things that I have a problem with is uh, when crime is committed, we, we have a hard time getting anyone to come forward to testify, and it makes it very difficult on our uh, system. So I was working with a guy named Brian Berg, and what we did is we put a $30,000 camera system up in the highest crime area down in Flint, Michigan. This is when uh, Mayor Don Williamson was there, and he, man, he received it, he accepted it, and it literally, that camera, we ran the feed into a police car, we ran the feed into a neighborhood organizing group, and then we ran the feed into a fusion center, and we cleaned up crime in a six-block area. It was a very, it was Cecil and Jewel was the address, and uh, this camera literally brought sense of calmness to that community. Uh, they lived in a fear of shootings and all kind of drug dealing and prostitution. And what we did is we put this camera in there, and then we put a light on top of it, and uh, we could sit there and monitor that community, that section of the of Flint, and literally push. What well, you don't ever do is stop it, but you push it out. And uh, and my thinking there is, why haven't we used that system in our city here? We I know. Have, well, they have, they have multiple cameras. Well, we we have and some now. And the sheriff's department has exactly what you're talking about: mm-hmm. portables with a blue light on top that they place in strategic areas. Yeah. So yeah. it's being done. Well, there's a, uh, a setup that I actually. Um, Bill Feddersfield, Sheriff Feddersfield was working with Brian on, and that was a, a system where we could mesh them, where we put cameras up, where we link them all together. And we literally, I know we have one down at the uh, market, uh, farmer's market down there. I see one down there, and that's that makes people feel calm and for parking and all that. But I just feel like we've got to go deeper into the where some of the distress is and uh, uh, link these cameras. That's what the city's been doing. They, they have... Uh over the years now, I don't know how many cameras they put in, but it's a bunch. But that that is certainly a, one of the methods being looked at and expanded on. It has to be. The uh, uh, the whole idea of it is is to record it, uh, and then that way you don't have to worry about witnesses. You can you know uh, try to identify the identify person. the person, and then also uh, um, uh, I I just feel that also that we need to. Um, be able to get some of these people off the streets that are really uh, causing a lot of the, 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 the issues that are scaring a lot of people out there, shootings and robberies and car hi- hijacking. So we got to do something. I, I don't think we should have the reputation of being a, a city that's uh, dangerous, and i got to overcome well, that. And what's interesting, because at our meetings we talk about this all the time, Part one crimes, for example, in the city are down. Uh, this year, the, the shootings, I think the shootings were down a little bit. Homicides were up a little bit. But the city, you know, typically, you know, it takes five minutes to build a bad reputation and start conversation. It takes 50 years to overcome it. Uh, and I often laughed at my friends from out of Saginaw who said, oh, I won't go downtown. He looked at a crime act. Downtown Saginaw is one of the safest places in the state. Very, very little crime. The neighborhoods, yeah, there's neighborhood problems. But uh, there's efforts. A lot of efforts. We, we all should look at the fact that our the chance in our city, which doesn't make sense to me, that a 12-year-old has the vocabulary of 300 words and that it prison sentence is easier to get than a diploma for for a male not female for a male and that's it's not something that we we, we need to address this yeah. and so um which will lead us to education yeah which we will get to after the break we're talking to robert zelly candidate for the 94th district in the state house when you have a- all right we're back with you here on the art lewis show talking to robert zelly he is a candidate for the 94th house seat in the state of michigan uh talked about crime another one of your uh items was education so let's spend a little time talking about education and what it needs and how we get there since we're ranked so low in education these days well i really believe that uh the kids in my district 
are not going to go on to college, not all of them. So I think it's time that we get back to teaching welding, mechanics, building homes. I really feel that we need to get back to adult education, community education, and I call it project-based education. And I just feel that there's a need to start looking at the kids in our district and the people in our district, and I think it's be better to teach them a skill than to try to get them to go through a system that, that they, uh, for whatever reason, are having a hard time with. So let me ask, uh, because we have the skill center here in Saginaw, part of the ISD. Well, that's part of the Saginaw school system. Uh, it's been there a long time, and for a long time they had trouble convincing students to go there and be part of the courses. It's changed now, you know, and you're right, because for years and years we said everybody's got to go to college, you know, at the uh, peril of uh, the trades, so to speak. And the reality is you could probably make more as a welder as you can, a college graduate mm -hmm. today. How do you get the kids to want to go? It's one thing to offer it, which it's out there. How do you convince them that it's where they should go? Well, I, first of all, I think it should be a county-wide education program, not just a City, well, so, it, but county students can go there. Can they go there? Yeah. Well, I, again, I guess I should look into that more because I, in Bridgeport at one time, we had probably the best uh, after-school programs. I mean, we there was nothing that you couldn't do. Yeah. It was like a small college. Uh, I can remember. Uh, My one son graduated from there. I know exactly what you're talking about. We had about. an amazing, uh, we, we built a home every year. Um, we had uh, broadcasting. Uh, Mr. Lipford used to run that program. We had uh, welding and we had fixing cars. And, and, and so I think it, it really actually, my son actually went to Bay City. He was in Birch Run Schools, and he went to Bay City to learn how to work on cars. And and really, he, it helped him a lot to get through the school system. How do we get those schools full with people? I think we have to work real close with the, with the educators. I think we need to work real close with the law enforcement. I think uh, uh, I think that would be a, you know, some of these kids uh, that are getting in trouble. Uh, um, there was a school called Frontier Learning down in Flint. When a kid got in trouble, um, he had to earn his way back into the public school, into the school system. He had to literally uh, get his act together, show that he um, could be a model student again, and work his way back in. And I think we've got to really do some things in education that uh, um, that we aren't doing right now. I don't think K through 12 is uh, the system that we have right now is uh, serving the community very well. Is money the answer? It, it probably is, but I actually feel that that uh, uh, we pay really good money for education right now. I don't. I can tell you this: teaching is a calling, and I'm not going to ever insult a teacher because um, it's not something that I was ever called to. And I believe they're special people, but at the same time, um, they're not parents, and and it's hard for them to teach when they have disruption in their classes, when they have kids that are not there for education. They're there because they'd rather hang out with their friends. Or, But uh, as far as solving it from a financial, again, I, I really think that uh, having an opportunity zone with like Dr. Ben Carson, I, I think they bring private money into it. And I think we got to find a way to get the private money into the system to help education and help these kids. I just remember when, when I moved here in 1974 and in the early 70s, uh, we had some of the highest paid teachers in the country, and we were 48th in results. And I said to myself, well, dollars don't seem to mean much, you know. It, it bothers me when I go by a school at 2.30 in the afternoon and it's sitting there closed or empty. I, I don't feel we're managing our properties as well as we could. I feel that uh, uh, there's no reason why um, we don't have more organized activity in these schools for these kids. Um, we really uh, uh, could manage the properties better. And when I went to school, we had like 240 days, 250 days, and for whatever reason, they cut it down to 220 days. And I just feel like other parts of the world— It's th less than that now. Yeah. I, uh, I think— uh, we need to use our facilities 
all year round. And I understand that that would come with a cost, but but I really feel that we're not uh, serving the, the community. That's why I think the adult education and the uh, community education would be really good to serve because you have a lot of – we have about 5,000 single moms in the city, city of Saginaw. I think they could use more education, and, and why not open up the system to them and some of the other people, grandparents and other people that would benefit from – uh, our facilities that we have here in a beautiful brand new high school um, in Saginaw, which I, I get to look out and see from my uh, office there. It's really nice. And, and you know, it's uh, hopefully it's going to be a unifier. I, it's long overdue. Um, we had to do the same thing in Bridgeport. We had to consolidate. Uh, I, I remember the day when uh, Douglas McCarthy was a big old school, and they separated and went to Eisenhower and, and MacArthur. That was a, a big ordeal where everybody on this side of State Street went to Eisenhower. Everybody on this side went to MacArthur. Uh, and so it was, uh, uh, yeah, long overdue, long overdue. But it takes cash. And, you know, credit the citizens of Saginaw for passing a $100 million bond issue and the federal government coming through with the difference because it cost more in the end. Uh, but uh, it's... You know, everything is based around money today. Yeah, and it shouldn't be. Um, I think education and what we teach these young minds are very important. Um, and I, I, I really believe that uh, we've got to find a way to uh, add value uh, to these. I, I, I'm bothered by something, too, that may go along with this. And that is the fact that in the city of Saginaw, they have no money in their budget for organized recreation or no feeder programs. And I really find that that is another problem because you've really got to find a way to, to get these kids involved in, it's not just basketball, but other things. And we, we just need to do something to to have organized activity uh, in these, in these uh, okay. uh, schools. How do you get rid of the tax cap? Well, um, I, mean, I I agree with you. There needs to be parks and recreation and money, but the city's hands are really tied. Uh, when we started the Ezekiel Group, uh, Doctor Glenn Nichols and I, he was a minister from Bridgeport. Mm-hmm. Um, when we started that group, the whole idea was to. Uh, when I met with him, I and I came up with it wasn't my idea. Actually, it was Martin Luther King's idea to uh, challenge the church leaders to do more. And uh, when he was locked up in in jail down in Alabama, he sent out a letter to all the church leaders challenging them to why are you not you know treating humans better than you're doing it? Well, we came up with the same idea, Pastor uh, Glenn Nichols and I, and we sent out a letter to all the churches and we met. And part of the issue was to organize the churches to put pressure on City Hall to at least have some money in their budget for recreation. And Ezekiel Group, one that I'm proud of because my son's name is Ezekiel, and and uh, we came up with that name because of, my son was born three weeks before that. And so that's how the name came up. And um uh, but it be, it, that organization, I'm kind of sad to say, I have not seen how they've done anything for organized activity, and it bothers me. So Take a break. Come back. We're talking to Robert Zelli. He's a candidate for the 94th State House seat, and we will return. Let me take a moment talk about uh, McDonald Ford and Quick Lane Freeland right next to my car dealer, McDonald Ford. Quick Lane Freeland is a one-stop shop for all of your routine service, brakes, tires, batteries, oil changes, you name it. And they work on all makes and models of cars. And they keep them in tip-top shape for you. And one of the things they do is also make it safe for your driving compartment. They have a product called Friggy Fresh. It's a hospital-grade disinfectant placed in the air conditioning system. Kills germs, mold, mildew, odors, and keeps you healthy in your car's environment. And best of all, it's only 20 bucks, takes 10 minutes you don't even need an appointment. Just drive in to Quick Lane Freeland and say you'd like Friggy Fresh. Remember, they service all makes and models of cars, keeping your car or truck in tip-top shape. Quick Lane Freeland, right next to McDonald Ford. The kids are back. All 
All right, back with you on the Art Lewis Show, talking to Robert Zelli. He is a candidate for the 94th State House seat. Uh, he is a Republican candidate. You will find him on the ballot in November. And uh, talked about uh, crime and education. I have some other topics I want to bring up. One of the things that cities are struggling with, cities, counties, is streets and roads and how we pay for them. Uh, Saginaw County passed a road millage, and it's, it seems to be the way of the world that every time we're going to need something, we have to go to the public for a millage uh, because the state revenue sharing has gone to heck in a handbag. How do we fix it? Well, as far as the roads, a lot of it is comes from the federal, don't, doesn't it? Most of the highways. Yeah, that's and, the, lo- the highways, yeah. The yeah. highways and state roads, yeah. they seem to take care of those. It's the city streets where you're beating up your car and yourself. Yeah, uh, again, I, I I feel there's a need for a partnership with the private sector. Uh, you need to look at other ways of generating revenue. Um, for example, I, I've, I've been for cannabis, for example, and the reason is because it generates more tax revenue. Well, I think you could earmark some of that revenue toward veterans, roads. Uh, another big industry that I feel that we need to look at that I think can really help our community, and that's the hemp industry. Um, and there's a lot of people that think hemp and cannabis are the same, but they're not. Uh, hemp has 50,000 different usages, and uh, I'm working on a couple projects that could literally bring in uh, manufacturing for hemp blocks, and I think by creating more revenue through uh, successful business ventures could help fix some of those local um, issues with taxes. So you earmark that money for this purpose. And Chesneen, when we uh, set up the big grow out there at the old Farmer Pete property, you know, part of the plan was to how do we you know deal with crime well with the extra revenue they were able to hire more police officers and so so we could do the same thing by creating uh which is a new commodity which is hemp we could really you can there's every uniform in world war one was made out of hemp the first pair of levi's was made out of hemp there's so much benefit from that commodity and now that in 2018 uh, is actually Trump signed the law that we can grow hemp in all 50 states. Michigan is behind on that. Other states are really picking up on it. They're building homes in Texas. They're building, uh, they're doing block manufacturing, processing plants. But we've got to pick up the ball here. We need to get the private sector to step up and set up the manufacturing, which I think will generate more tax revenue. Well, let me ask you this about manufacturing. Uh, for example, Corning is coming in, building a billion-dollar plant across from Hemlock Semiconductor. It's estimated they're going to employ 1,100 people. Where are we going to find the housing for them? And how do we get middle-income housing that makes sense, affordable housing? Well, I've done a lot of research, and I would suggest to the audience to look into hemp Crete. If you use the hemp plant, you grow the plant in 15 weeks, you process it, and you make blocks in hempcrete and they are claiming across the country across the world that it's about a 40 percent savings on building a home when you use hemp product and so um, i think we could create some real nice affordable homes with hempcrete and that's something that i'm working on something that i really believe in and uh um and i agree we're we're five million homes short in the united states for for based on the growth of the population so we've got to do something uh, to change that. And I think um, by looking at the hemp manufacturing of blocks, I think we could really deal with affordable housing. So, All right. Take our last break, and we'll be back with Robert Zelli, candidate for 94th State House seat. When's the last time you had your ear? Back with you on the Art Lewis Show in our final segment talking to Robert Zelli, Republican candidate for the 94th District State seat. Um talked a lot about uh, things we'd like to do and it all takes money and all of that. Another thing that's being bandied about is how to attract industry into Michigan because we lost a lot. People leave the state rather than come back to the state. 
Do we put money on the table? How do you invest in bringing businesses to the state? Well, I think Michigan uh, is an amazing state from this standpoint. We have, we're strong in agriculture. We have over 10 million acres of farmland with about 56,000 farmers. And I really feel that we are, are, and with the Great Lakes surrounding us, I think we have the best. I was told that Michigan had the second most uh, best land because of our water around us and the first is in the Nile River so we have actually the best soil in the United States and so so Michigan has a lot of neat benefits here it's got the four seasons we've got uh, a lot of reason to attract people um but uh but creating the industry again I think by looking at the hemp industry and that's a new commodity I think we could really set up a lot of unique manufacturing with paper mill. You know, at one time, Michigan was one of the top paper company uh, education. Uh, Western Michigan was very big at educating farmers on why they should grow hemp for paper, um, textile, clothing. We wouldn't have to buy anything from China if we focus on uh, setting up the manufacturing for hemp right here, right here in the mid-Michigan. I think we're right here in the heart of it, and I think... Uh, I'm going to really uh, encourage uh, people to definitely look at Michigan and come here and set up their block companies, uh, the paper company, textile. All right, so uh, let's, uh, let's, for the fun of it, use your example. Hemp Company A wants to establish a location and build whatever they're going to use the hemp for, blocks, let's say, right? And they look at Michigan. And they look at Tennessee, and Tennessee says, oh, come on down. We're putting this on the table. We're giving you this. We're doing that. What is Michigan doing? Why do they come here rather than that financial attraction sitting down there in Tennessee? Uh, great question. Um, when you look at growing the hemp here in Michigan and then taking the biomass and making blocks, I would rather – from a business standpoint, it'd be a better cost effective by having it grown here and built here and then instead of shipping the blocks from Tennessee to here. Now, my thoughts on setting up a block company here, we would literally service Ohio, Indiana, Illinois from Michigan. So I wouldn't set up a block company just to service the Michigan uh, builders, but I would set one up that would literally be a dis distribution for mid united states and so uh, and I, I do believe uh, we have uh, uh, i think a good workforce here to do this i think we were at one time one of the top manufacturing uh, states and uh, the auto industry has left us and so why not uh, um, why not uh, look at the uh, the new commodity and uh, set up a paper mill or a or a plastic company that's the other thing it, it's biodegradable the uh, the hemp plastic uh, you, I mean, you, there's so much benefit to hemp. It's just amazing what it can do for the environment, what it can do for creating jobs, uh, what it could do for building homes, affordable ho housing. And I just think uh, uh, that's where the future is, and there's no reason why we get behind the eight ball there. Let's get out front of it, and let's, let's find ways of making that happen. All right, so, Robert, you are a candidate for the 94th district seat currently held by Amos O'Neill. Why should we vote for you? Well, I really feel like I can solve some of the problems that we have uh, in, in my district. Um, I believe I have solutions to these problems. Um, I'm not uh, your typical politician. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I, I feel like we need to uh, take more action focusing on some of these problems. Um, uh, I put my name on the ballot because I didn't want... Um, my opponent to run without at least some uh, dialogue, without some type of uh, uh, communication on differences of how we do things and what we can do. Um, I'm not a career politician. I'm I'm somebody that just has a. I got 11 grandkids, and when I represented Dr. Carson uh, when he was running for president, I asked him. I said, "Why are you running?" And he said, "Because he didn't want his grandkids to grow up in a godless society." And that had an impact on me. And so so my thinking is 
you know, I don't want my grandkids to grow up in a godless society, and I want to find ways of trying to unite us um, without harmony. That's one of the issues. I'd like to find a way of bringing harmony back in the equation. Um, I think Mr. O'Neill is an, a super nice man. I think he's a good person. Uh, I am not looking to attack him personally at all. I, I just want to be able to have uh, a chance to sit at the table and talk about some of these ideas and work together. I think that's been the missing piece, by the way, in, in, in these distress areas. I think uh, they do not have the two-party system. I think it's been managed and run by one party pretty much my whole adult life. And I think it's good to have a a different view, a different approach on uh, dealing with the issues. Well, Robert, thanks for uh, thanks for being with us today. We appreciate it. Thank you, and uh, uh, it's really a privilege because Art, you definitely are somebody that uh, I've respected for many, many years, well, and so thank it. you, thanks, thank Robert. you very much, Robert Zelly, candidate for the ninety fourth state house seat, and we will be back to tell you what's happening next hour. I'm attorney Jerry Reif, and I'm part of the Art Lewis Show. Coming up next hour, Trish Burns is going to be with us, the director of the Bay County Library System. Talk about an anniversary coming up. And uh, after the news, of course, that's what comes first. CBS News and Jonathan Dents in the WSGW Newsroom. I'm Art Lewis, and we'll be back right after these notes. Broadcasting from the... At cars on a highway in Laurel County and wounding five people. FBI Special Agent Michael Stansberry. The FBI, the ATF, and, and everyone up here is doing everything they can to, one, solve this investigation, to make the case to prove that this individual is the one who, in fact, did this crime, but also to make sure that we apprehend him and get him into custody. The search is focused in the woods, 75 miles south of Lexington. Correspondent Christian Benavides is in London, Kentucky. It is rugged terrain out there. It is difficult to search. Uh, one of the officials who spoke to me told me that they sort of had to look over a cliff to even be able to discover the rifle and some of his belongings. Two New Jersey school districts are closed today over a social media threat. KYW's Tim Jimenez is in Woodbury. Police just announced that a 15-year-old from Mulliga Hill was arrested as part of all of this. Now, we already knew from police that two others one from Woodbury, the other from Glassboro, were taken into custody. More incidents being reported involving airline passengers and highly flammable lithium batteries. Correspondent Chris Van Cleve has details from L.A. So far this year, there have been 37 incidents. And according to a new study released this morning, 60% of Americans are unaware their devices are powered by lithium batteries, while 27% have even admitted to packing them in their checked bags which is against FAA regulation. A warm welcome for the Pope in the tiny Southeast Asian nation of East Timor. The National Catholic reporter's Christopher White from Dili. The turnout here is really staggering. Tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, on the street trying to get a glimpse of him. It was quite something just to get from the airport to the city center. Nearly all of the people of East Timor are Catholic. Dow up 331. This is CBS News. Sponsored by Progressive Insurance. Get renter's insurance to protect the things that make your place a home, including coverage for theft or damage. Visit Progressive.com. Get high-quality paints. Live from the 100.5 and 790 Newsroom, this is WSGW News. 64 degrees at 10.05. Good morning, I'm Jonathan Dent. Police say a suspect is in custody after a shooting that injured one man in Bay City on Saturday. According to police, the shooting took place around 1.47 a.m. behind Dusso's Bar on Midland Street. A 37-year-old man was found in the parking lot suffering from a gunshot wound to the abdomen. Authorities say the suspect, a 38-year-old man, had already fled the scene when officers arrived, but was found by police in Saginaw and returned to Bay City. The victim was taken to a local hospital to undergo surgery. Police are asking anyone with information to contact the Bay City Department of Public Safety at 989-892-8571 or call Crime Stoppers at 1-800-422-JAIL. 
The Michigan State Police has established 18 full-time community service trooper positions with 16 currently filled. CSTs are trained in public speaking, teaching, and community engagement to improve police community relations. This fall, they will introduce Juvenile Justice Jeopardy, a program for K-12 students focusing on legal issues like truancy, rights during police encounters, and topics such as bullying and vaping. The CST role, first established in 2011, now reports centrally to MSP's Grants and Community Services Division for better statewide coordination. The program aims to prevent youth from entering the criminal justice system and enhance student safety. The City of Midland has announced that printed copies of its Midland City Modern Master Plan are now available for purchase. The plan provides an overview of Midland's past and present, focusing on local economy, land use, and transportation. It also outlines goals for infrastructure, utilities, health, and the environment. Copies can be purchased for $10 at City Hall or the Grace A. Dow Memorial Library. According to the city, the plan aims to be engaging, with large photos and clear language, offering a user-friendly experience. It serves as Midland's official policy guide for community development over the next 30 years. A free digital version is available at MidlandCityModern.com. WSGW News Time is 10.07. Join W News Time 10.08. The weather forecast is coming up. A 15-year-old temperance girl is arrested following threats of gun violence at a Monroe County school. The Monroe County Sheriff says deputies were contacted Saturday afternoon by officials from Whiteford Agricultural Schools in Whiteford Township concerning a threat against the school planned for today. They learned the threat was sent via a group text message involving students at the school. That's when school officials were alerted by a parent of one of those students. After an investigation, the teen suspect was contacted by police and later taken into custody, being lodged at the Monroe County Youth Center. A small-caliber bolt-action rifle was also seized from the home. As a precaution, Monroe County Sheriff's deputies will be boosting their presence at schools today. With all the hype about the Detroit Lions, there's a new partnership between the lottery and the team. As a fan, Michigan Lottery Commissioner Suzanne Screlly is excited about this one. We launched on September 3rd three Detroit Lions-themed games, and they are going to give Michiganders an opportunity to win up, of up to $500,000. We have an instant ticket game that is a $5 game, a pull tab game, which is a $1 game, and we also have an online instant game as well. Instant games are available at lottery retailers across the state, and the Lions theme runs through the end of the year. When you see news happening, call the WSGW Newsroom at 752-0790. It's 1010. I'm Jonathan Dent. Good morning. Welcome to hour number two of the Art Lewis Show. And this morning we're going to talk about the Bay County Library System and its 50th anniversary. And you're saying, ah, come on, the library's older than that. Well, yeah, but, and we're going to find out about the buts this morning. And with us is the director of the Bay County Library System. We say good morning to Trish Burns. Good morning, Art. How are you? I'm fine. Glad to have you down here. We definitely see each other. There's thousands of books around us for a big book sale. Typically, that's where we meet. <laughs> so, because I asked you, this is the first thing I asked. I said, 50th? Library's got to be older than 50, but it's the system. So explain to us how we started and how we got to this point. Sure. And a lot of people have been asking that question. So I think we've been doing our PR correctly because I'll, everybody's <laughs> going, well, wait a minute. This is not. So in 1974, the five branches that were currently in operation came together under the Bay County County of Bay, actually, um, and became the Bay County Library System. All right, so I got to ask, mm -hmm. what were they before? Just individual libraries operating on their own? Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Um, each library operated somewhat on its own. The library service in Bay County started actually in 1869, and each of the branches operated pretty much autonomously, and in 74, you know, as you take a look and see what things are being duplicated in your area and how you might be able to do things better together, that's when they decided that they would become an actual system and all become under one umbrella, so to speak. 
So this was 50 years ago. 50 years ago. I know. And people are going, well, wait a minute. You know, I, I went so to Sage 60 years ago. Yeah. See? So you, you've been here as long as the library system has. Oh, gee. <laughs> <laughs> and you've changed just as much as the library system. Yeah, sure. Oh. <laughs> and so have you. Anyway, and in fairness, I mean, I knew Trish when she was in the Saginaw system for 10 years uh, and then moved to the base system. Uh so how how did it change what all of these branches did? I mean, you had a branch here and a branch there. You still have branch here, branch there. What happened when it became a system? How did it change what happened in the library? Many of the things became more similar. And a lot of times when you have things in a similar manner, it's a little easier to do, it's a little more economical to do, and the way the library branches ended up coming together, for example, now we have the idea that all of them are under one catalog, so you can go and look up any book on the catalog in any of our branches. And then that even expanded out further, so we now are in a consortium of 23 other library systems, so you can look up books through 23 other library systems on our catalog as well. So coming together actually expanded access for the county. So uh, if I go to the, which is now digital card file, <laughs> I still say card file. So do I. Um, and I look up uh, a book called the ABCs of Book Finding. Uh, will that tell me, A, if you have it, and B, what branch it's in? Absolutely. And that hadn't been able to happen prior to us coming together in 74. So now you can look up and find what library has it, whether or not it's on the shelf. If it's not on the shelf, you can put a hold on it. Or if it's in Pinconning and you want to pick it up at Wirt, you can ask for it to be sent to Wirt and it'll show up the next day. And then if it's elsewhere in one of those other 23 library systems in our consortium, you can do the same thing. You can order books from anywhere in the state of Michigan, basically, and have them delivered to the Bay County Library System. So is the system the same today as it was in 1974 when it coalesced? Uh, by that I mean... There were, what, X number of branches, five branches or whatever it was back then. Do we still have all those branches? It's changed a little bit. Um, there, In 74, when we did come together, the library system was, let me see, I have to look in my little notes here. Um, in 74, it was the Sage Library, the Bay City Branch, the Broadway Branch, Pinconning, and the Bookmobile. And now it is Pinconning, Auburn, Sage, Wirt, and the Bookmobile. So we still have five outlets, but they are different. And then at one point, we also had a South End branch, and that is no longer open for patrons to come and use except for on Fridays. The Bookmobile actually lives at the South End branch, and then the um, the friends have all of the books that are donated at that South End branch as well. So all of the books that get donated throughout the year go to South End, and then they get um, sorted and put together for the book sale. So the building is still used, but it's for the bookmobile, for the friends book sale, and then we do open it up um, on Fridays for patrons to come and use the bookmobile. There. So the bookmobile is not a new concept? It is time. not. The bookmobile has been around for quite some time. In fact, um, the bookmobile service started in 1967, and we've gone through five different bookmobiles since it started in 1967. We run 45 different stops per month for the bookmobile, and it goes through the entire county. Regular schedule? Regular schedule. Can people look it up and see when the bookmobile is going to be in their neighborhood, so to speak? They absolutely can. They can go on our website, baycountylibrary.org, and find the bookmobile schedule. We change the bookmobile schedule a couple of times during the year. It changes during the summer because some of the schools aren't open and will be in different places. And what's in the bookmobile? I mean, obviously, you can't put a whole library in the bookmobile. <laughs> can't put an entire library in the bookmobile, but you can put a lot in a bookmobile. So we have a lot of um, 
actual physical books. We have a laptop that people can use if they want to come and check their email or if they want to download a book. We have programming that's actually done out of the bookmobile. And if you want a book that's at a different library and you want to pick it up at one of your bookmobile stops, then we'll put it on the bookmobile and have it at the stop that's convenient for you. So it's a mini library on wheels. That's exactly what it is. And then we also have some technology with it and programming. So, yeah, it's a mini library on wheels. Now, technology is another interesting thing in the library system. And I kidded about the card file, and I've told you this many times. I love the old Dewey Decimal card files. And uh, I'm not as enamored with computers, even though my life is surrounded by computers and I go home and I got a big computer. I did. There was something about, in the same way, maybe you relate to this, in the same way there's something about holding a book in your hands as opposed to reading it on a computer. It was that same tactile feeling going through the card file as opposed to sitting there and, you know. And by the way, if you have any questions about the Bay County Library System and its 50th anniversary, we'll take calls. So you can uh, call and talk to uh, to Trish Burns, the director of the library system. Do you understand what I mean about that tactile feeling? Yeah, and it's it's funny that you say the tactile feeling like that because whenever I have conversations with people and they say, what do you do? I say, I'm a librarian. And they're like, oh, my gosh, I love the way the books feel. I can't do a Kindle. I love the way the books feel, and yeah. I love the way the books smell. And then other people will say, oh, gosh, I love my Kindle, and I'm so glad that you guys offer downloadable eBooks for free off your website. Uh, and it's taste. It's personal. It, it is personal taste, and I grew up using the card catalog as well and going through there and flipping. Mm -hmm. If you can see me right now, my fingers are actually flipping through (laughs) like I'm actually doing it. And, and yeah, it was a thing. And you, and you open that drawer and you had that squeak and then you'd flip through the little card catalog files and you'd go and you'd find your book. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can do the same thing on the computer, but it is different, but it's, it's convenient. (laughs) You can do it anytime. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll come back. We have a caller waiting, and we will uh, chat with our caller, too, as we talk to Trish Burns, the director of the Bay County Library System, celebrating as a system its 50th anniversary. I'm Kamala Harris. And we are back with you on the Art Lewis Show, talking to Trish Burns, director of the Bay County Library System, the system celebrating 50 years. And we got a couple of callers. This is Kevin in Saginaw. Kevin, you're on with Trish. Good morning. Good morning, and good morning, Trish. I just had a quick question. I'm at work, so I'm just going to ask it and hang up and listen. Um, I heard all about the shipping books from library to library. Do you also have audio books? And if so, is it the same process to get them? Yes, we do have audio books, and it is the same process to get them. We don't have as many audio books as we used to, though, because a lot of it's going to digital and downloadable. So if you're interested in audio books that you can download, you can do that through our website. And if you need the actual physical audio books, those get shipped around just like the regular books do. From library to library? Yes. Including the 23 in the consortium? Yes. Um, some libraries don't ship everything that they have, but most of us ship most of what we have. And we'll say good morning to Errol in Saginaw. Errol, you're on with Trish Burns. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, good morning, Trish. I got a question for you. Do you do exchange um, library systems with, uh, say, Canada or overseas at all? If someone wanted a book that, oh, well, maybe it's available in Wales or or in Canada someplace, do you have an international system that you can exchange books with? That's an interesting question. You know, that is an interesting question. What we would typically do if it's something that's in Canada or overseas, we would try and possibly purchase it and then have it in our system. Or if it is something that's difficult to purchase, then we would try and get it for you, but that's not 100% guarantee on that. We have a much better rate on getting things from within the state or from state to state. And frankly, we don't get asked a whole lot about international. Okay. Interesting. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't know if I actually answered your question very well, but we would do our best yes, to try and get it to yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. Yes, you did. That answer. I wondered for a long time uh, whether you actually could guess, say you wanted something from Wales out of curiosity, if you had a way to exchange back and forth between the European system in the North American system, and you've answered my question. 
All right. Thank you very much. You're Thanks, welcome. Earl. I enjoy the libraries. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. And you might also want to check with um, your local university as well and see if they might be helpful on that. Oh, All right. that's an idea. Thank you very right. much. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. That, that's an interesting question. The libraries are universal. Every country, even third world countries, have some kind of library, don't they? Absolutely. And some of the libraries are on the backs of donkeys or on the backs of horses. And they are... And they, that's the way that you can actually get books and items, you know, from village to village or mountain to mountain. So it's um, it's a little different from what we have here. But, yeah, it's universal. It's it's getting information in the hands of people and giving them access to what they need. The knowledge of the world ends up in books. Even though we have computers and everything else, almost always ends up in a book, doesn't it? Yes, I think that it does. And I think that people that spend the time to do the research and learn how to write a book and actually publish a book, there's a lot of time that goes into it. There's a lot of energy that goes into it. There's a lot of pride that goes into it. And they want that information to be out to the public. And they want that information to go out and people to read it and people to understand are the amount of books considered by your library for intake the same as they were 10 years ago when you first started? In Bay, you've been in the library system longer than that. but I, I've been in the library system a very long time. It's She's not that old, folks. Yeah, I know, but it's like, I was thinking about that on the way here. I've been in the library system in one way or the other for 42 years, and that hit me in like a slap in the face in the car. You know, I'm like, oh, my gosh. Um, and she only looks 30, so it's, it's amazing. So, yay, and that is exactly why I like to come and talk to you. Every day. Um, so what was the question? Oh, how oh, many so, books? Yeah, so, has, has the amount of books available to a library changed? You know, that, that's a good question because I don't know the actual numbers. Um, it has not, I don't believe it's gone down. I think it has increased because it is easier to get published at this point. You can do a lot of self-publishing. Oh, uh, well, I was going to say. So there are a lot of different ways that you can get a book published now than 20 years ago yeah, even. It's not as easy to get it published where the publisher will pay you. <laughs> but that if is, you want to pay for it, you can get a book published, right? That is correct. And I'm going to kind of pivot on this if you don't mind because talking about publishing and and getting books in the hands of people last year we did a local author festival at the Bay County Library System and it was really successful so we ended up deciding that we would do it again and we're going to do it on Saturday November 9th at the Alice and Jack Wirt Library that's the one on Center Road in Bay City and it's going to be from what is it um, for two hours all it says is a two-hour block of time, so we're going to have to figure that out, aren't we? But this, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> clearly, I didn't make my notes as well as I thought I did. But there's a call for local authors right now, so if you'd like to go online, um, the deadline to apply to be in it is Friday, October 4th. So go ahead and go online on our website, and there will be a way that you can um, try and get yourself in so the local author. What will happen author. there? Is there a table for each author? There's a table for each you author. you walk around and talk to them? Or? Yep, so there will be an opportunity to talk to all of the authors. Um, some of them will have a short um, amount of time to speak themselves, but primarily it's going to be the tables will be there, and you can actually come in and interact with the authors themselves. The Find out how sale? the books will be for sale. Um, the authors will normally autograph the books if you would like that and that gives you an opportunity to find some different authors that are more local that you might not have seen the books on the shelves and then also um, get some information if you are an author yourself and want to try and be published all right take a break come back we're talking to trish burns she is the director of the bay county library system celebrating its 50th anniversary this year we'll talk more about that when we return, and we invite your calls at 989-752-6111 to chat with Trish. Let me ask how you slept last night, because you know in this day and age we're asked to do more for less. So when you go to bed and you theoretically spend a third of your life there, you need quality sleep. You can get it with a quality mattress from Sanitary Mattress. Now, You can visit all the so-called sleep stores, or you can rest assured the mattress you're using is manufactured right here in the Great Lakes Bay region to your specifications. 
Your dollars are spent and they stay right here in our local economy. Your time in bed may be cut short by today's demanding world, but don't be fooled. You can still get a quality good night's sleep on a sanitary mattress, and they feature a one-hour delivery window of your mattress to your home. What does that mean? Well, it means you don't have to wait around all day. If you have an RV or a boat, Sanitary Mattress will custom make a mattress for you to your exact size, something the box stores can't do. Visit the Sanitary Mattress factory and showroom serving this area since 1935. Set your GPS to 5343 Janes Road in Saginaw, just east of the Harry Brown Airport. Visit them on the web at sanitarymattress.com or call them at 989-753-1757. I have with me Jeff Carrick from M. And we're back with you here at WSGW talking to Trish Burns, the director of the Bay County Library System. If you have any questions for her, 989-752-6111. I know I've talked to you before about this, but it's one of my favorite topics in libraries. In the old days before computers, if I wanted a piece of information about anything, I'd pick up my phone and I'd call the reference librarian who either held me while she found it or he found it, or at least said, I'll call you back. Are they still in existence today? They are still in existence today, and we have several in the Bay County Library System. So you can, just like you can call today and talk to me, um, you can call any of the libraries and talk to people that are actually smarter than me and will answer your reference questions, or you can come in. And then we also have an opportunity on our website that you can do a chat on our website as well. So we're trying to make it as convenient as possible to answer any of the questions that you have. And it used to be that the reference section of the library was hands-off in terms of taking books out. Uh, in some libraries, hands-off in terms of you walking the shelves that the librarian had to get the book for you and bring it to you. That's still the case today, or is it? You know, it depends on the library. Um, Bay County, all of our shelves are open. We don't have anything, you know, quote, in the back room. Um, we, most of our reference books we have online now. And the reference section, in terms of actually being a shelving section, is much, much smaller than it used to be because we can get a lot of it online instead. And you can come and you know use the reference books as as you wish it's interesting how questions have changed over the years because you know 20 30 years ago a lot of questions were do you have this book or can you tell me how many raindrops fill a bucket or <laughs> questions like that and those were actually much easier to answer because they were very specific right. and it you didn't have as much information at your fingertips as you do now. But you don't deal in opinion. I mean, you're dealing in facts. Absolutely. And the questions that people ask now are more, okay, I have to add a new spark plug to my lawnmower and somebody did this and now I have to find that and blah, blah, blah. And do you have? Mm -hmm. So there's just a, a wide variety of things that people ask now that they may not have asked before and it's they're like three four or five part questions um i need to i need to look up a court case for this and then you ask why they need to and well it's for this specific reason okay do you need information on that as well well yes i do because this is how this came about well do you need information on this so it, it just you know <laughs> yeah, it just mushrooms. keeps going and going and it mushrooms and it's wonderful because they're great conversations and um people i think for the most part feel really good when they get done talking to the reference librarians because we treat everybody equally and we treat every question like it's important when I knew you were coming on, I always do this when I know I'm going to get to talk to you. I try and come up with a question that I hadn't asked before about the libraries. Uh-oh. And I was having trouble <laughs> this time. And then it struck me. I have a question I have never asked you before. How, and this is pertinent to this day and age where there's been so much controversy, how are books chosen to be purchased by the library and put on a shelf? Who does that? We have a variety of staff in all of our branches that choose the books. 
our children's librarians choose the children's books, our teen librarians choose the teen books, and our adult and reference librarians choose the adult and reference books. There are trade publications that share what the books are that are coming out next. So we're able to pre-order all of the books that we know are going to be hot. And then we also look at, um, we look at TikTok, we look at the internet. We look at all of these different social media sites to see what's hot. We look at what the talk shows are talking about. Um, we look at what's in the newspaper and we look at what's happening in our communities and see what is being published that will answer the questions that our communities will be asking or what they will enjoy. So there's a, a wide variety of people that order all of the books for us and they use um, a wide variety of ordering media, and they're also looking at a lot of book reviews that other people that have been able to see the book first have reviewed it and said, you know, yay or nay, and then they, they use that as well. So part of your budget has to be book purchase. Oh, absolutely. And yes. do you get a special library rate? We usually do get a discount from publishers, and it, it varies from publisher to publisher. You know, it could be 5%, it could be 38%, and that's, you know, really high. But, yeah, we, we do get um, discounts on the, the purchases that we make. From the time, let's take a novel, not a, a regular novel. Patterson puts out a new book. Every 12 minutes. <laughs> right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So that book is going to hit the store shelves on such and such a date. Do you get advanced copies, or is there a time hold, if you will, before you get the copy so that they can sell the book? Typically, we will get the book when it hits the shelves in Meyer or Costco or in the bookstores. And depending on what the author is and what the publisher is, we may get it a little ahead of time, but it is, quote, embargoed, and we cannot put it on our shelves until it hits elsewhere. So that's always really exciting when we have a book that nobody else has, and we can't do anything with <laughs> yeah. it, and it has to sit there under yeah. lock and key. Yeah, we get embargoed news the yes. same way. You know? Yep, exactly. So how long does it take? I mean, the book comes in. How long does it take for you to put it on the shelf? You have to catalog it. You got to number it. You got to do all that stuff, right? You sound like you're a librarian yourself. Look at we do. I've talked um, to you so long now. Oh. <laughs> I've learned the trade. <laughs> it comes into our acquisitions department. Um, you know, obviously, it's unboxed and invoiced, and we make sure that what we ordered is actually what we got. Then, yes, it does. It needs to be processed. It needs the pocket, and it needs the label, and it needs some of them get extra covers, and some of them don't get extra covers. And then it needs to be put into the library system so you can look at it in the library catalog. So depending on if it's a really common thing, like a James Patterson title, it'll be a day or two or three. And if it's something that's a little more esoteric where there isn't already a um, an entry in the catalog for it and we have to actually do an entry ourselves, then that's going to take a little longer. So, And if there are ever questions, does somebody sit down and read the book to make sure it's appropriate? We Yeah, absolutely. Um, we cannot read every book that goes in the yeah. library, for sure. But if we're looking at reviews and we're doing the ordering the way that we're supposed to be doing the ordering, then yes. But on the opposite side of that, there will always be someone who feels a book is not appropriate, oh, yeah. regardless yeah. of what it is. And that's certainly their opinion, and we recognize that they have that opinion, and we make sure that there are items that, if they feel this one is not appropriate, then we have one that they should feel is appropriate. So we, you know, we recognize that everybody has a different view of what they feel is appropriate for themselves and their family. All right, we'll take a break. Come back with Trish Burns, director of the Bay County Library System, celebrating 50 years as a system. And we are back with Trish Burns, director of the Bay County Library System, celebrating 50 years as a system. So I've saved this question for the end. How are you going to celebrate 50 years? <laughs> Very quietly. Oh, yeah, right. No, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. So we're going to have a celebration at each of the buildings. And tomorrow, actually, is Wirt's. So Wirt is celebrating September 10th, Pinconning September 12th, Auburn September 18th, 
and Sage September 19th. And all of those are from 5 to 7 p.m. What, the bookmobile doesn't get to celebrate? The bookmobile is going to be driving around <laughs> celebrating. Oh, okay. So they'll be celebrating all around the county. We can't just pick one space for them to, to do that. Um, so there'll be cake and refreshments and giveaways and drawings. Um, we have these wonderful puzzles that have a picture of the building on it. And you can win one of those in one of the drawings. And we have Joel Tacey coming in to do balloon twisting for the kids. So um, just pop on in. It's just like an open house sort of thing, anytime between 5 and 7. And like I said, there'll be cake and refreshments and special things to do and tours. Um, and just, you know, whether you're somebody who comes to the library or not, whether you're somebody who comes to the library a lot or if you're somebody who's new to the area and just want to come in and see what we have, everyone's welcome. You do not need to register. You can just come on in at your convenience between 5 and 7, any of those dates. So speaking of registering, what does it take to get a library card these days? Oh, super easy. You can go online and on our website and do it in just probably 30 seconds. And then you can use that number to do any downloads if you need to until we send you the actual card. Or you can come into any of our branches, fill out a short form, and we can do one right away. We just need some sort of proof of address. But it is geographic. You have to live in Bay County to register as a user of the Bay County system. This is a little confusing. Um, to get everything that the Bay County Library System offers, including our downloads and streaming, yes, you do need to be a county resident. However, um, a Saginaw resident can come and use um, our services and check items out, but they just can't do everything that right. we offer. Right. So we, we do save, we save the best for our county residents. And there still is a physical library card? There still is a physical library card, and we do a little keychain one too, so you can keep it with your keys so it's easier. And typically, you take a book out, how long can you keep it out? Three weeks. Wow. Mm -hmm. well, that's a fair amount of time. It is. Mostly you can, most people can get through it in three weeks. And if not, if no one else is waiting for it, it will automatically renew for you for another three weeks. And we'll send you a little email and say, hey, we just auto-renewed this for you. So you've got another three weeks. So if I remember my library books, inside there was a, plastic, uh, a cardboard holder and there was a piece of cardboard in there that they stamped the date on and all of that. And that told you when you had to have it back. Still? We Not exactly, no. Um, now it's just like at Meyer when you check something out, a receipt spits out. And instead of telling you, you know, that you bought broccoli and carrots, it tells you that you checked out the James Patterson and the John Sanford, and this is when they're due. So you get a little receipt with your due dates and everything that you checked out. So you Sheesh. can keep that on your refrigerator with a handy library <laughs> magnet that we can give you too. <laughs> <laughs> or you can go online and check and see in your um, account when things are due as well. So you know, everything I'm saying today, there's like two or three different ways to do it because we're trying to be convenient where people are in their world. So if I, if I were a Bay County resident and I went online and I wanted a downloadable book, mm -hmm. I download the book. Mm -hmm. There I have it. Does it disappear from my device after three weeks? Does it automatically terminate? What happens? There is still a little bit of magic in libraries, and that's one of them. <laughs> uh, yes, it's ch it does. It just disappears, goes poof after three weeks, and you don't have to worry about them being overdue. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't own it, though, when I download it. You do not own it when you download it. You own it for those three weeks, but that's it. That's it, huh? Yep. Uh, library hours? Library hours vary from building to building, and again, those are handily convenient on our website, baycountylibrary.org, and all of the hours are on there. And then we've got so much on our website that you can use. It's almost like an extra branch, so you can use it whenever it's convenient. And remember, folks, it's not just a library with books. They have programs for youngsters, teens, you name it, all kinds of things going on. We Trish, had yeah. Go ahead. We had fourteen hundred programs last year, or so. Uh, we have things going on every day I at guess. each. So, Trish, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Happy fiftieth. Thank you. We'll be back to close out for this Monday. Back tomorrow with lots more coming up on Focus. We're going to talk about Sawmill Pub and Grill with Megan Kehoe, the food and beverage manager, and some plans they have. That will follow the news. News from CBS. And Jonathan Dent is in the newsroom this morning with the local report all coming up.
next. Broadcasting from the 